Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Goat Roadshow. Tonight's webinar will look at understanding more about what you need to do to ensure your goats are fit to load. We've got a stellar lineup of presenters here to give you a comprehensive overview of fit to load requirements for the Australian goat industry. Before we make a start, I'll run through some housekeeping for tonight's webinar. If you have any questions during this evening's web webinar, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please make sure these are written as questions rather than as statements or comments. We'll have a live Q&A session with our panelists after this evening's presentations. So my name's Daniel Forward and I work as the MLA project manager for Sheep and Goat Productivity. And tonight I'll be helping facilitate uh, the session. Our first speaker is Dr. Baron Squire. Since 2005, Baron has worked for the Victorian government as a veterinary officer for the Mallee in Northwest Victoria. In 2009, she was fortunate to start a part-time role assisting Victorian goat producers with their disease, welfare and legislative issues. Outside of work, Baron has her own small boar goat herd, which keeps her busy on the weekends. We're absolutely pleased to have Baron with us today. Over to you. My talk tonight is on, are your goats fit to load with on-farm animal welfare obligations? So this is an example here, the picture here. Young weathers being transported to the abattoir. What you don't see in that picture is in the front of it, they've actually got wind protection when they're driving. So with the chain of responsibility, the person in charge. You, the producer, are responsible prior to loading. The transported driver is responsible for loading, unloading, and during the journey. And the end person, the producer, the agent, the sale yard at the other end are responsible for them after unloading. So with the chain responsibility, what are you responsible for? Ha mustering, how are you mustering them? Are you doing it on foot with the dog? Is your dog muzzled to prevent bite injuries? Motorbike, vehicle or helicopter? When you're assembling them, are they different ages, different sexes? Do you know their pregnancy status? Are there different weights, horns, sets and styles? Consider if there are entire male goats in the load. Will they bully or harass cycling or heavily pregnant does? Are they mobs that have just been mustered together? Do the goats need to work out their hierarchy so there's no fighting whilst they're being transported? Handling prior to loading. Are these goats which are used to human contact intervention or have they never seen a yard before or only twice a year? How stressed have they been by the mustering yarding process? Should you consider acting, adding electrolytes to the drinking water to assist in their recovery prior to transportation? Are they actually fit for the intended journey? You don't just consider the initial step. What about to their final destination? What is the time taken to reach that destination? The transport being used, the weather. Wind, is it windy? Is it rainy? Will the goats get chilled? Goats don't have a subcutaneous fat layer to keep themselves warm like sheep or cattle. And you might be nice and warm or cool in the cabin, but what weather conditions are your goats in? Do they need wind protection, shade? If you happen to need to break suddenly, have you considered what will happen to your goats? Feed and water provisions. There are the Australian Animal Welfare Standards and Guidelines for Transport of Livestock that Dr. Waite will cover off on later. But consider, are your goats dehydrated? Are they starving? Are they scouring? Will their feces in urine increase the slipperiness of the transport vehicle flooring leading to injuries? Do the goats need time to recover from mustering? Is there a curfew requirement if the destination is a salyot or abattoir? Do you need them to empty out before loading so they arrive in a particular condition at their destination? If you've clipped, washed and preened them for a show, you don't want them covered in feces when you unload them at the other end. Wherever they are going, you want them presenting in the same condition as they left your farm. What loading facilities do you have on farm? Do you have a ramp? Or are you expecting the goats to jump up into the transport vehicle? Does the destination have an unloading ramp? or are they having to jump down onto concrete? For small loads, many sale yards and shows have a portable unloading ramp that you can use. Have you actually checked your holding yards to ensure that goats cannot injure themselves on the fencing? 
uneven surfaces or if they're trying to jump out and escape. If you're not transporting the goats yourself, do you advise the transporter as to when they last accessed fetal water, their fitness, their pregnancy status, their body condition scores? Is there the potential they might be anemic, anemic from barber's pole worm or blood sucking lice? Is there any reason that the goats might not make their destination? Have you completed all the necessary paperwork? The National Vendor Deck. If selling to another property, have you completed a National Goat Health Declaration? Now this is voluntary, but answers a lot of questions that the buyer should have asked. And are your goats analyzed, analyzed compliant? MLA is the Animal Fit to Load Guide also has some really useful information. And I suggest if you don't have a hard copy, look at it online or order one so you can check what you're required to do. Another good resource for your responsibilities is the animal, is the Australian Industry Welfare Standards and Guidelines for Goats, which was developed by Animal Health Australia with the Goat Industry Council of Australia, GAICA, after national consultation with various goat industry sectors. It's available online, but you can also get a hard copy from Animal Health Australia if you would like. And in the standards and guidelines, a standard, which is a must, a person must take reasonable actions to ensure the welfare of goats under their control. So that's understanding standards and guidelines, obtaining knowledge of your relevant local and state government regulations related to goat keeping, Obtaining and demonstrating knowledge of the relevant animal welfare laws, understanding goat behaviour and using low stress stock handling techniques, assessing the quantity, quality, palatability and continuity, continuity of feed and water supply, using handling techniques which minimise stress, being able to identify distressed, weak, injured or diseased goats and taking appropriate action, and being able to humanely kill goats by appropriate methods or seeking the assistance of someone who is capable and equipped to kill them humanely. So with fit to load, they need to be able to walk on their own bearing weight on all four legs. Do they have a leg deformity, a foot abscess, swollen joints, arthritis or long, long toes? If you recently foot paired them, do they need time to recover before, before being transported? Any condition in an animal that is affecting their normal movement strongly indicates that that animal is in pain. And goats are a prey animal and try to hide or mask issues and exhibit few obvious signs of pain or distress. And transportation, when they're in this condition, will only cause further pain and suffering. Are they free from visible signs of severe injury or distress or conditions likely to further compromise its welfare? If they've got horns or have scurs, or any of them ingrown or causing abrasions, wounds by rubbing on the skin? Do any of them have a hernia that in transit could lead to twisting and stricture of abdominal organs? Do any of them have got mastitis? If those have kitted recently or in full lactation, Will they require milking before they reach their final destination? Do any of them have any vulval or rectal cancers? As goats are tail up with the Australian sun, we need to check especially if white pigmented skin around, is around the vulva or rectum. Are there any visible external abscesses that could rupture if the goat bumps against the transport vehicle? Are any of them affected by photosensitization from toxic plants? They've got infected wounds or broken horns. Are they strong enough to make the journey? Are they emaciated due to a feed issue or a disease issue? Are they anemic due to a nutritional, barber's pole worm or blood sucking lice? Understanding how you can check anemia scores by using the FAMACHA scoring is essential. Can they see well enough? to walk, load and travel without impairment or distress? 
eye disease or blindness can be caused by grass seeds behind the third eyelid, causing tearing and ulceration, conjunctivitis. Some blinds of goats are prone to entropy. So that's one thing to consider. That's where the third eyelids actually curl in and rub on the eyeball. Excessive weeping and oozing can be indications of pain. And goats are more prone to injuries. They cannot see what they are doing. Best practice recommends that animals within the last four weeks of gestation should only be transported under veterinary advice and should not be consigned to a sale yard or an abattoir. The issue with pregnant does is that their pregnancy is maintained by the corpus luteum and stress of transportation can cause this to rupture, leading to the doe aborting. Penalties for animal cruelty offences vary in each jurisdiction but all have provisions for jail terms and fines. This is a relevant section of Provincial Cruelty to Animals Act, which is in Victoria. And under the cruelty section, a person who loads, crowds an animal where that loading or crowding in confinement of the animal causes or likely to cause unreasonable pain or suffering to the animal is committing an offence. If you drive or pack an animal in a manner or position or circumstance, which is, will lead to unnecessary pain or suffering, that is an offence. If you sell, offers, offer for sale or convey an animal that appears to be unfit because of weakness, emaciation, injury or disease to be sold or driven, that's an offence. And if you, as the owner or the person in charge, have a sick or injured animal and unreasonably fail to provide veterinary or other appropriate attention or treatment to the animal, that can also be an offence and deemed to be cruelty. So if it's not fit to load, what can you do? This particular goat in the picture, it's scouring. Is it scouring because of the lush green feed or does it have a high worm burden? It's fluffed up indicating that cut. So you can't really see its body condition score, but it's quite low. And it's also got a little bit of um, subventricular edema. But once you treat this animal and you, re and you can then reassess it once it has recovered and then it may be fit to load. If it's not fit to load, consult a veterinary surgeon and transport under veterinary advice for some some areas, this does need to be written. But if in doubt, leave it out. If your vet cannot come to your property, do you have the means to transport the goat safely to, to the vet? And not within the cabin or within the boot. So in Victoria, we, under the uh, Provincial Cruelty to Animals Regulations, transportation of animals, People are not allowed to place or transport an animal in the boot of a sedan motor vehicle. If you are transporting a farm animal or livestock, you've got to make sure that it's had access to water before the maximum time off water, the specified in land transport standards. You cannot transport a farm animal or livestock in a passenger vehicle unless it's transported in a cage or in the cargo section that there is a barrier that prevents the animal from moving into the seating area of the vehicle. And the animal needs to be able to stand upright without any of the part of the animal coming into contact with the roof or the ceiling or the cover of the cage. Now, if the animal is not able to walk on its own by bearing weight on all the legs, it can't be transported unless it's either accompanied by the vet or written veterinary advice states that the animal is fit for transport. Can, however, if, if the animal is being transported for medical veterinary or other appropriate treatment, you can transport within 50 kilometres to either the vet or another property that's less than 50 kilometres without needing that written veterinary advice. So if a goat breaks a leg, you don't need to get written permission before taking it to the vet if the vet's within 50 kilometres of your property. So with the standards, 
if it's not fit to load. I mean, it's an unfortunate thing to consider and if it's not viable to treat it, then need to consider, do you have the means to euthanize? A person in charge of a goat suffering from severe distress, disease or injury that cannot be reasonably treated, treated for, or which has no prospect of recovery, of recovery must ensure that that goat is killed or euthanized at the uh, first opportunity. With goats, you have a, a couple number of options. You can use either a firearm or a captive bolt or a lethal, lethal injection by a private vet. A number of goat clubs have actually um, purchased between them captive bolts so they can humanely euthanize goats of their members if they can't get vets. But you cannot use the bleeding out by exsanguination by the neck cut to kill a conscious goat unless there is no firearm, captive bolt or lethal injection available. And in most instance, instances, majority producers either know someone in the community, can ring a vet or have understand, have someone who can come and assist them in that matter. The big thing to consider well, if you do euthanize, is to confirm death. We use what's called a five-finger head check, ensuring that there's no blink, the pupil's dilated, there's no jaw tone, there's no tongue tone, tone, and there's no breathing at five minutes. Why are we concerned about the welfare of transportation of animals and welfare on farm is that there are public and trade expectations. The whole supply chain has welfare obligations and you as the producer are the first step in stopping and preventing a welfare issue from happening. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Baron, for your insights on and sharing your knowledge on the chain of responsibility and our welfare obligations when assessing if goats are fit to load. A reminder to everyone tuning in tonight that if you have any specific questions for Barrett, you can write these in at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll endeavor to get to them in the Q&A at the end of tonight's session. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Petraea Waite, a Senior Program and Project Officer with the Animal Welfare Unit from the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Dr. Petraea Waite graduated from Murdoch University in 2003. She worked in mixed private practice in the wheat belt of Western Australia and rural New South Wales for 10 years before becoming a district vet with local land services based on the Monaro in southeast New South Wales. After eight and a half years in that role, she moved across to New South Wales DPI's Animal Welfare Unit Livestock Team, where she's now worked for almost two years. Over to you, Petraea. Thanks, Daniel. All right, just check my slides are working. You can all hear me. I hope that's all good. So just a quick introduction about what I'm going to be talking on. Um, I'm looking more at the legal responsibilities and the laws that um, guide animal welfare during the transport um, phase. Um, so we'll look at the different state animal welfare laws and how transport sits under that. Uh, we'll look a bit more in depth at the National Transport Standards and Guidelines and uh, the fit for intended journey or fit to load requirements under that. And we'll look a bit at the responsibilities around assembly preparation and loading, but are your responsibilities legally? So you've seen the uh, Victorian legislation. Um, now, because I'm in New South Wales, I'm going to show you the New South Wales legislation. Now, our uh, animal welfare laws are somewhat out of date. Uh, they are due for review and they are getting that review very shortly. So we have a pretty short uh, little section, section seven in the New South Wales Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, which regards carriage and conveyance of animals. And it says, um, a person shall not carry or convey an animal and where the person is in charge of an animal to authorize that carriage or conveyance from an animal in a manner which is unreasonably, unnecessarily or unjustifiably inflicting pain on the animal. And then we have some penalties around that. So just breaking that down a bit, um, a person shall not, so that is anybody um, who is in charge of an animal, um, shall not carry or convey, so that's any form of transport, 
and it can be whether the person is in charge of that animal at the time or whether they're authorising somebody else to carry or convey that animal. So that means you as a producer are the person who are authorising that animal to be carried and conveyed. Therefore, you have a responsibility to ensure that animal is transported in a manner which doesn't cause it pain um, or distress. So we do have those clauses there about unreasonably, unnecessarily or unjustifiably. We know that accidents happen sometimes during transport. And, uh, you know, sometimes animals don't make best life decisions about what they're doing and, uh, and, and accidents do happen. But what you need to do is ensure the animal is fit before it gets on the truck, because that's when it comes back to bite you as producer. Um, yes. So we'll just go on and have a look at what the other states and territories do. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them in detail. I know we've got everybody just about from a different state um, online tonight, but um, many of the um, other animal welfare um, acts uh, do it in a similar manner to what New South Wales does in that we have it written, they have it written to the act that you must not transport an animal in a manner which causes harm or something similar. Other states prescribe it in their regulations. So we have acts which, are, you know, the, the, the laws that govern it, and then we have the regulations which sit under the act and give more detail about what those laws do. Um, so in those regulations in some states, they'll have uh, a setting out of the minimum care requirements within those regulations, or they'll have a separate regulation that relates specifically to the transport of an animal. What all states do is they prescribe the uh, Australian Animal Welfare Standards and Guidelines for Transport, uh, either in their Act or under their regulation. So the Australian Animal Welfare Standards and Guidelines for Land Transport of Livestock, Baron's already mentioned them, but um, it is a very big document. It's about 132 pages, and I imagine many of you aren't even aware of them. But I have put the uh, the link there to them, or sorry, the, the address there for them, and um, I'm sure that will be shared with you at some point. Uh, through the talk. Um, so they are worth having a look at. Um, they do give a lot of detail about what your legal requirements are around transporting of animals. And we just go on to the next slide. Um, as I said, they are um, prescribed under every state's um, animal welfare legislation, but being different states, we all do it slightly differently. But I guess the important thing there is to look at the words in red, uh, mandatory, mandatory, mandatory for just about every state or compulsory requirement or legally enforceable. Uh, the only state that does do it slightly differently for goats in particular is Western Australia. Um, those standards and guidelines have been made mandatory for cattle and sheep. Um, but for goats, uh, it's a code of practice under the Animal Welfare Act. So it becomes evidentiary for other livestock, which includes goats. Now that means um, it's not mandatory that you do those things, but if you end up in court having to defend what you've done, um, so if you've been charged with cruelty in, in transporting an animal or in transporting your goat, um, if you can prove that you have um, maintained the level of requirement in those standards and guidelines, then that is evidence that you have not committed an offence. So just looking a bit more in detail at those uh, standards and guidelines again, as Beren mentioned, we do have them broken down into standards and guidelines, as the title implies. So the standards are the things that you must do under your state legislation. As I said, it's mandatory in all states except Western Australia for goats where it's evidentiary, but it sets the minimum standard for transport. And then we have the guidelines. These are the things you should do, and that makes um, your transporting process um, best practice management for transport. So it gives you more information about the best way of doing it to help you meet those standards. Those standards and guidelines are then further broken down. We have a general section which applies to all species and is mandatory for all species, regardless of what type of animal you are transporting. And then we have some species specific standards and guidelines in the second half of the document, because we know that there are species specific requirements, you know, transporting goats is different to transporting horses, it's different to transporting pigs or ostriches or anything else. So there is a species specific section, which is broken down into standards and guidelines in those sections. So Baron's also already mentioned the, uh, the fit to go load guide and the glove box guide. Now you may be more familiar with these. Um, 
if you aren't familiar with the uh, the national standards and guidelines, what these two documents do is distill all those standards and guidelines down into a much more easy to digest and a ready retina of those standards and guidelines in a very easy manner to uh, keep on you. So these literally are something you can put in your glove box or in your pocket and keep with you. So the MLA has the fit to load guide and that's been um, endorsed by all those um, different organisations you see below the, uh, the logos there. Uh, so Go Industry Council is one of them. But we also have the glove box guide, which was put together by MinTrack and LBRCA. And uh, that includes all the fit to load guidelines, but it was developed um, around the time we were very worried about uh, some exotic diseases coming into Australia. And it also has some really good information about the, the signs to look out for for emergency animal diseases that you might see in your livestock. Um, I have put the addresses there for both those documents. They are both available online, but you may also be able to get them through your ag department or your um, livestock resellers um, or any of those sorts of places as well. So I guess one of the questions you might be having is, is how do people actually enforce these laws? So there are a number of points where um, there are inspections and audits done on animals to ensure that they have been that uh, you know they are meeting the guidelines for transport. So one of the places that uh, we often see, particularly for the goat industry, because a lot of goat meat is exported, is the animal welfare incident reports. Uh, now these are reports that uh, are raised by export accredited abattoirs. So um, each abattoir has an on-plant veterinarian, which is employed by the Federal Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. And uh, they are obliged to raise an incident report any time they see an, any animal come off a truck with some form of adverse welfare. Um, so they then go through the process of collecting evidence and taking uh, videos and um, photographs and writing a report. And then that report is sent to the state of origin for that animal, as well as to that state um, agriculture department as well. And then once those reports are received, by the various states, um, they are assessed uh, to make sure that the evidence in them is uh, suitable. And uh, we then potentially go back to the abattoir of origin and ask for more questions. So we get all the details and then we forward those reports on to one of the enforcement agencies for animal welfare. Now the enforcement agencies um, for animal welfare may vary depending on the state. So we have RSPCA available in every state. Um, they are where we send them to for livestock. They, they work more in the livestock area than some of the others. There's also the Animal Welfare League. They tend to be more small animal and city-based. Uh, we don't tend to use them, but in other states, that may be where they go. Departments of Agriculture in other states, particularly Victoria uh, and Queensland, I believe, also do their own enforcement of livestock laws, particularly around um, NLIS and, uh, and transport and welfare. Um, and all police officers in New South Wales, and I believe in every other state, are also, also authorised to uh, be able to follow up animal welfare. Um, in New South Wales here, we have the Rural Crime Prevention Team, which we used to refer to as a stock squad, and I'm fairly certain that similar arrangements in other states. Another place where um, animal welfare problems with transport may be showing up and being looked for is in sale yard inspections. So many of the enforcement agencies will go out to the sale yards and, and do spot checks, um, particularly departments of agriculture. If they've got enforcement officers around, um, they're often there looking at the NLIS requirements, but they will also look at animal welfare. And, uh, and they do report that back to other states and, uh, and they do contact the, um, the producers who've sent those animals in if there is an animal welfare issue. Agents and sale yard managers, they become responsible for animal welfare once animals are consigned to them. So they are keeping an eye on what's going on. So your agent may give you a call and say, you know, you've sent an animal in and it doesn't meet the guidelines and, uh, you know, we don't want you to do it again. What do you want us to do with that animal? Uh, sale yard managers in many states have um, authority to be able to, um, to put animals down uh, if they are cruel to be kept alive and don't meet uh, fit to low guidelines. Um, if there are serious animal welfare incidents, they can certainly report that through to one of the enforcement agencies as well. There are also some animal advocacy groups who do do sale yard inspections. There is a group called Animal Angels, sorry. Um, they do go around to sale yards. They have cameras, they have videos, they take footage and they um, write reports and send them off to uh, the enforcement agencies and, uh, and ask questions about why these animals are presented at these sale yards. I do want to stress that these animal advocacy groups do not have any enforcement powers. 
they can't charge you with anything. They can't make you do anything, but they do have cameras. They do take photographs and there's nothing stopping them from putting that on social media or any of those other places. And I'm pretty sure you don't want to be the person whose animals end up on social media with broken legs or something like that. Uh, as I said before, New South Wales Police, um, they have powers under the Animal Welfare Act here in New South Wales, and I'm fairly certain that would be the same across um, all states. Um, they can look at animal welfare under any situation, so they can pull you over. They have to suspect that you've breached an animal welfare law for them to pull you over to look for animal welfare, but they may be pulling you over for other reasons. You know, it, it may be a vehicle problem. They could be doing compliance checks for other legislation, like checking NVDs up before or after sales um, or any of those sorts of things. Um, here in New South Wales, we've actually been training our uh, rural crime prevention team in animal welfare and the things to look for. So uh, they are very much on the ball when it comes to uh, what is and isn't appropriate as far as animal welfare goes during the transport process. So we're going to look a little bit deeper into the um, standards and guidelines, those national standards and guidelines, and we'll have a first look at the general standards and guidelines, which are called apply to all species. Now it's broken down into several sections and we'll just bring them up. So the first section is the responsibilities and planning. And as Baron mentioned, this is the most important part of the, uh, the planning and of the journey. Making sure you've got it right before you put those animals on the truck is the most important part. So stock handling competency is covered as well. There is uh, information in there and guidelines and standards about um, how vehicles should be set up and what facilities are appropriate for the livestock you're transporting. Um, the pre-transport -sele selection of livestock, the fit to load, as Baron has already been through. Uh, loading, transporting and unloading of livestock. Baron's given you some good information about that as well already. And finally, humane destruction. Um, obviously, it's not something we like to have to talk about, but accidents do happen and animals sometimes do need to be dealt with um, in a very timely manner. So you do have responsibilities around that as well. So if we now go and look at the standards for goats, so these in the species specific, there are three standards there and they are around the most important parts of ensuring animals get to their destination in a fit and healthy manner. And that is ensuring they have a minimum, uh, a maximum time of water and a minimum spell, depending on the, uh, the category of goat that you are transporting. So please note that it is a maximum time of water. That is not the time that you have to keep animals off water before you transport them. And then there is a minimum spell after they've been that, that duration of water. We also have some requirements there about uh, the use of electric prodders and they can't be used on goats known or visually assessed to be pregnant. Right, so if we go further down, we'll go into the guidelines for goats and there are guidelines around fitness for travel, around the provision of food and water, loading densities, the vehicles and facilities that you're using, around handling and around humane destruction. And again, Baron's given you a lot of detail about that already, so we won't go into too much more detail on that, but we will have a bit of a look at some of those guidelines as they're specifically spelt out in, in the uh, standards and guidelines. So we'll look at the first part. Um, the very first point in the standards and guidelines in the general section is standard 1.1. Person in charge must exercise a duty of care to ensure the welfare of livestock under their control compliance with the livestock transport standards. And then we have it broken down to the responsibilities of each person through the chain. Baron's already mentioned that, you know, the responsibility starts with the consigner who is the producer in most cases, and it then moves on once the animals are on the truck and when they get to their destinations. So the consigner is responsible for the mustering and the assembling, the handling, the preparation, including inspection to ensure they're fit to load, the feed and water provision before they're transported and for any holding periods before loading. We're going to look in a little bit more detail at those as well. So mustering, assembly and handling. Um, Baron has been through a fair bit of this, but that is something you do need to consider and to make sure that your animals end up being fit to get on that truck. Um, you know, consider the methods of mustering you're using. Are they coming from an extensive system where they're going to be walking several kilometres? Uh, are they going to be, you know, in hot weather? Um, do they need to be rested? Um, do uh, Are they mingling different mobs? Do they need to familiarise themselves with each other before they get on that truck so we don't have fighting? Do we have kids or heavily pregnant does which need to be separated out or bucks that need to be separated to prevent fighting? Are there any husbandry procedures that might need to be done before they are transported? 
And, uh, you know, how long have you given yourself to get that done? Um, disbudding, horn chipping and castration can all be painful procedures. Um, they are going to increase pain and suffering during the transport process if they're done too soon um, or too close to transport. So it is required that you give at least seven days minimum um, to, you know, undertake those procedures before you transport. Another thing to consider is, you know, do you have collars, ropes or chains on them? Are they likely to get hung up on them if you leave them on for transport? Take them off before you transport them if you do. Preparation inspection is the next section. So I guess one thing I really want to um, bring to the fore here is it's not just about fit to load. It's actually about fit for the intended journey. It's not just can they get to the yards and can they get up the ramp. It is are they fit for the intended journey. When we've got goats coming out, particularly from some of those rangeland areas in the centre of Australia, they can be going on very, very long journeys and, you know, they often go to a sale yard. Um, they can be going across state borders. They can be in transit for many days in some cases. So we need to consider that before we transport them. So you've already seen uh, this list through Baron. Um, assessing them for being fit for the journey means are they able to walk on their own by bearing weight on all the legs? Now, one question we always get is how lame is too lame? Um, I would say, again, it depends on the length of the journey. Obviously, if you've got an animal that needs veterinary treatment and you're transporting to a vet, it's got to be the, the shortest journey possible. But if you've got an animal that looks a little bit lame coming into the yards, you know, if it's obviously lame at a walk, then it shouldn't be going on a truck. If you can only just tell that it's lame as it trots, then it may be suitable for a short journey, but it may not be suitable for a long journey. So keep that in mind. Severely emaciated animals should not be going on trucks. Um, we did talk a bit about underweight animals with, when, in Barron's talk, but there may be different uh, locations that it's suitable to take animals that are underweight to. If they're severely emaciated, if they're weak, if they're struggling to stand up, if they're you know struggling to keep up with a mob, they should not be going on a truck. Uh, if uh, they are underweight but they're still strong, they may be okay to go directly to a sale, yeah, uh, sorry, to a, an abattoir or onto a gismond, but they need to go somewhere that's a short journey and it's going to put them in a better place. If they're you know, a bit underweight, but, you know, we're still looking at a fat score or body condition score of one, then they're probably suitable to go through a sale yard. Visibly dehydrated, we've covered, showing visible signs of severe injury or distress. We've looked at increased pain or distress during transport. Blind in both eyes is another one that we often get problems with. Um, pink eye can be a real issue for goats. Um, they may be blind because of the severity of the pink eye, but they may also be blind because their eyes are really sore and they don't want to have them open out in the sunlight. So they are functionally blind and forcing those animals to, to transport, you know, okay, their eye is probably normal. They can see if they open them, but making them keep those eyes open is going to increase pain and suffering. And the pregnancy, um, they're not allowed to be transported if they're within, well, they may be transported if they're within two weeks of parturition but they must have their journey limited to four hours or less. So Berin did put this slide up, um, or this little flow chart up on one of her slides. Um, that is a really nice summary that comes out of the, um, the glove box guide. And uh, we are actually getting some uh, signs made up to go at sale yards, um, but it's a really nice little checklist to uh, use as a ready reckoner to determine if your animals are fit for the journey. So it takes into all those uh, requirements that you need to meet. And if you answer no to any of those questions, then they're not fit for the journey or they're only fit if you get veterinary advice. If they are meeting those requirements, then go ahead and put them on the truck. So food, water and holding, again, Baron's cover a little bit on this, but some of the things you might want to keep um, in mind when you have got them assembled is that they do need to have some food and water prior to the journey, particularly if they're going on a long journey. Um, if they're pregnant, we really don't want them off food and water for very long at all. As Vera mentioned, uh, goats are very prone to aborting if they're going into a negative energy balance, um, and that can certainly happen during transport. So they should be receiving adequate food and water before getting on the transport. Um, if they're going to be held for a long period before transporting, um, you may be doing that to acclimatise them. They, they should be held for three or four days so they become accustomed to the feed. We have had situations with these rangeland goats, these unmanaged goats coming out that have never been fed before. Um, they get 
on these multiple day journeys, they get provided with food and they have no idea what to do with it because they've never seen it before and, and they literally starve to death. Um, one of the times we do particularly want to keep animals off feed is when they're on lush green feed. Um, that increases the water content of their digestive tract. And uh, those transport trucks only have so much capacity in their effluent tanks to, uh, to take that water. And if we've got, you know, animals that are, are putting out a lot of urine, a lot of water from green feed, um, you know, in the form of diarrhea, to try get diarrhea, basically, um, those effluent tanks are going to fill up. What happens then is as they're being transported, that water splashes up onto those goats. And if it's cold or windy, or we've got vulnerable animals, particularly our young kids, then uh, they really uh, end up with hypothermia. And uh, that's not a good thing to go with, uh, particularly in these southern states where we get the cold weather. Now, just finally, um, loading obviously is partly the responsibility of the consigner, um, but also the responsibility of the transporter. Um, the responsibility for the consigner is actually letting your transporter know some of the things about the goats that you are going to be transporting. So what species and class are they? Um, you know, do they have long fleece on them? What's the horn status? Um, letting the transporter know that before they get there helps them plan their journey and helps them choose the appropriate size vehicle and uh, those sorts of things. Um, and you may need to consider segregating animals be uh, based on those um, criteria. And uh, you're going to be much uh, in more in the good books with your transporter if you've got them segregated before they arrive, particularly if you've got mixed consignments and you need to mix them, but you don't want to mix them up on the truck. So just finally, some take home messages. We've mentioned these before, and I think Beren's also mentioned them too. Planning and preparation is the key to a successful journey. Um, you know, we want those animals getting off the truck at the end of the journey you know, maybe a little bit tired, maybe a little bit hungry, but just as healthy as when they got on and planning and uh, doing that preparation is really important to get there. It's not just fit to load, but fit for the intended journey. Don't just assume because it can get up the ramp that it's going to be okay at the other end. And finally, if in doubt, leave it out. If you're not sure that it should be on a truck, then it probably shouldn't be. Get the advice of your veterinarian, get a certificate if that's what you need. But yes, if you're not certain, don't put it on. So that's all for me. Thanks, Petraea, and especially for your oh, outlining our legal responsibilities and requirements under the standards and guidelines to ensure that goats are fit to load. Again, if anyone online tonight has any specific questions for Petraea, feel free to uh, pop it down in the Q&A box uh, just at the bottom of your Zoom window. So finally, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Bradley. Now, Elizabeth is Manager of Quality Policy and Compliance at Integrity Systems Company, or ISC. As manager for quality policy and compliance with ISC, Elizabeth oversees the Livestock Production Assurance or LPA program and the National Vendor Declarations and the approval of NLIS animal identification devices. Elizabeth also works closely with government and industry on how to improve and expand the integrity system. Having worked as an auditor and in food safety, quality, environment, agriculture and exporting, Elizabeth has first-hand knowledge of Australia's biosecurity and export legislation, policy, program operation, and an in-depth knowledge of animal welfare, traceability, and the supply chain. Take it away, Elizabeth. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Yes, so tonight I'm going to talk you through your LPA requirements uh, with the lens of uh, fit to load as well as um, NVD and a uh, touch on NLIS requirements as well, just as a, as a reminder about your requirements. So. Um, before I start, I just wanted to put into context because it can get a bit confusing with all the different people in industry where ISC fits. So we are a subsidiary of Meat and Livestock Australia and we provide the services to the, the red meat industry um, and we take, um, you know, really care and consideration around what, what the producer sector needs in terms of the integrity system. And when I talk about the integrity system, I'm referring to the Livestock Production Assurance Program, or LPA for short, and the National Livestock Identification System, or NLIS. Um, we love our acronyms in our industry. So uh, if, if I say one and you're not sure what it is, feel free to ask what it is. Um, so LPA and NLIS work together to, to provide us assurance around what's happening right through the supply chain um, and giving us traceability from for the lifetime of animals, which really helps underpin our market access. So that's how you can sell your, your goats and the money that you make from them. So 
LPA is all about your on-farm assurance processes and gives you access to use the LPA NBDs or the ENBDs as well. Um, and it looks at your on-farm practices in relation to food safety, biosecurity, animal welfare and traceability. Uh, the NLAS, on the other hand, is the legislative requirements around identifying and tracing livestock. So that's where you get your pick from the State Department. You um, need to identify your animals and record movements in the database. So LPA is a voluntary program um, that's that's heavily driven by the processing sector to make sure that they, they have that assurance that that meat from your animals is safe to eat. Um, where NLAS is a legislative requirement that you absolutely must adhere to regardless of your size of operation. So if you have one goat, um, you don't need to be an LPA, uh, but you definitely need to make sure you're following your NLAS requirements um, along the way. So both of these systems work together um, to, to form the integrity system. So that's why we're called Integrity Systems Company. Um, but I'm going to run you through a little bit around um, what the LPA program does and focus in on those fit to load and animal welfare requirements for you tonight. So within the LPA, there's a key document called the LPA standards, um, and it's the on-farm practices or the requirements you need to meet when you become accredited in LPA. So the seven requirements are up on screen for you. Um, the first three there are around property risk, safe and responsible animal treatments, and um, basically what you're feeding your livestock all relate into food safety. So reducing the risks that your animals might eat or you might treat them with something and then become contaminated um, because that can cause a food safety incident or, or risk um, once they actually become meat and turn into human food. So there, I won't touch on those requirements in, in heavy detail tonight, but they are questions that you need to answer as part of completing NBDs. So they are important to, to understand. Um, I will talk around preparation for dispatch of love livestock, which is very much in that fit to load, fit for the intended journey requirements that Petra and Bowen have talked about already tonight. Um, I'll run you through the LPA NVD requirements as well as the NLAS requirements at the end, um, and also your requirements under LPA um, in relation to animal welfare and the animal welfare standards and guidelines. The other one there that's in the middle is around biosecurity on your property. Um, so just a gentle reminder of if you haven't got a biosecurity plan, it is a requirement under LPA. There are templates available for free that you can fill out or you can do it online through your LPA account as well. Um, it helps prompt you and answer some questions. So it's a really important document to fill out um, about your practices on farm. But we can start off with talking around um, element four within the LPA standards, which is around preparing your livestock for dispatch. So I know the other ladies on the, on the webinar tonight have run through selection of animals and your requirements under the, the different legislation. So I won't rehash all of that other than to say that the LPA standards pulls all that together and it is an audible requirement. So when you're on farm, if you get selected for an audit um, as part of your LPA accreditation, um, the auditor will come and ask you questions around how you're meeting these requirements. So within the standards, there's two requirements that relate to goat producers. So one is around um, selecting animals that are fit for that, for that transport um, and reducing the contamination risk um, in relation to that transport. The other one is around um, when you assemble your livestock that you're minimising stress and contamination of those animals. So they're the two outcomes or requirements that you need to meet as part of LPA as a producer, which you can do relatively um, easily. Um, through a number of things that the ladies have already covered tonight. So ensuring your animals are fit to load. So using those really great resources if you're unsure. Adhering to time or feed and water requirements, especially if you're sending direct to processing. Um, transport, even if you're doing it yourself, is it is it suitable? Is it clean? Is it is it going to cause more stress than, than not? Um, and also completing your LPA NVDs or other records around what you've done um, in assembly as well. Retaining copies is also a really great and important um, step around um, fit to load as well. So the other element in LPA around, um, I guess, dispatching livestock or, or livestock traceability in general, which is really important, and it kind of touches on a number of different things, which I'll just speak to in relation to um, goat traceability in specifics. So I've broken it down into two types of um, activities, you can call it. So dispatching or receiving. So they're kind of the two things that you can do and the two systems that work in conjunction with each other. So LPA and VDs um, and the NLIS system. So tips for meeting these requirements under LPA around when, you, when you're loading your livestock out, dispatching 
dispatching your goats, um, making sure that you've got records to back up the declarations you're making on your NBD. So if you have treated your goats with, with drugs or veterinary chemicals because they needed it, um, if they're still in a withholding period, making sure you've got those records and recording that on the outgoing NBD is really important. Um, again, it's a food safety thing because potentially that animal could end up um, on someone's plate. Uh, keeping copies of NVDs that you that you can sign, so it's a requirement to keep a copy of everything that you you also provide. So making sure they're complete, accurate, and you're keeping records of those. Um, and for farm goats in particular, so making sure they're identified with an NLAS um, identification device before you they move off your property is also a legislative requirement under the NLAS and your state legislation. So that's dispatching goats in particular. Uh, if you're receiving goats in from somewhere, uh, make sure you obtain a copy of the LPA NVD um, and have a look at it and actually check to see if they might be in a withhold period or there's other information on that document that might indicate um, something you need to know. Um, you can also request animal health declarations around their health status as well, which is an important document um, if, if disease um, statuses are important. Uh, also, as a responsibility under NLIS, you need to make sure that those goats are moved onto your pick in the NLIS database within two days of their arrival. Um, again, that's the legislative requirement, you know, regardless of if you're a hobby farmer and you have one goat or if you've got um, a thousand of them, um, that's really important for traceability through the supply chain and making sure we're ready in case um, we need to trace animals really quickly. So the NVD um, is an important document. So partly in that it communicates the food safety status of your animals to the person who's buying them. Uh, the other part is it's actually a movement document that, that fulfills um, a legislative requirement to have that movement um, accompany the, the livestock consignment. So on screen, we've got a, a snip of the, the current goat NVD and waybill, um, and it's broken into different parts and I'll run through them in 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 just a little bit. So the important thing around NBDs is they do come in paper book copies and there's also electronic versions that we have that you can access through your LPA or MyMLA account now um, and a mobile app version of them as well. So the electronic versions are the same and they sync together. The paper versions, obviously you buy the books from us and we post them out to you. So when completing an NBD, it's important that you answer all of the questions um, to communicate all of that information to the, to the person you're giving or sending those goats to. Um, and we'll just run through basically the different sections and explain it for you um, now. So the first part we talk about is part A. So part A is all around um, your details as the owner of the goats, where the journey commenced, the description of the goats you're actually sending in that consignment, um, who they're going to and the location that they're being consigned to. So it's really important that you fill this out with as much information as possible. Um, and just a note there as well that if you're in Western Australia or Tasmania, um, it's a requirement to put the pick where the goats are actually moving to because that's a legal requirement um, for those states. Um, there's a quick note, if you're consigning to a company but they're actually at a different location, there's a consign to as in the company and the destination if it's a physical address that's different to the actual company's address. So as much information as possible and if you get stuck, there's explanatory notes um, in the book as well as guidance in the electronic system um, that you can access to check what you need to fill out for each section. The other important thing here is the PIC. Um, so on screen, it's PIC 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's a fictitious one I made up, but effectively that PIC is your PIC that your LPA accredited for, and it comes pre-printed on the books, um, and that's how you access ENVD. So we know that it's starting from your property and you're consigning from your property. So that's an important start of the traceability um, as well. So the next section I've kind of combined two just for ease on screen, but it's on two separate kind of columns on the actual book. Um, we have six questions in relation to your on-farm practices um, and in relation to the goats that you're consigning. So the first two talk around um, if you if you own the goats and if if you have for their entire lifetime. Next is around if they've been consigned to a feedlot prior or um, subject to any treatments. Then we're talking about if they're in a current withholding period. So again, we're getting into the food safety requirements around making sure that that meat is safe to eat if it, if it is going to processing um, and if they've consumed anything that might still be in a withholding period as well. So answering these questions, if you're ever unsure about the answer, it's best to, to answer yes and then just add comments at the end in, in six to make sure that you're communicating any risk um, down that supply chain as well. So um, it's important to answer all those questions as honestly as possible to reduce the risk of any issues um, are down the line. Question five there is an important one around animal fats as well. Um, and that has to do with something called restricted animal materials, which is a bit of a risk um, in relation to goats. 
So it is a requirement that no goat should be fed restricted animal materials or RAM. It's another acronym we like to call. Um, and it's part of your NVD declaration. So when you actually read the declaration, it, it says, you know, I have not fed any of this material to my goats. Um, and RAM products include meat and offal, animal fats, blood, meat, bone or blood meals. So there's a disease risk associated with this that we need to avoid at all costs. Um, so it's really important that if you're unsure um, or just avoid feeding this altogether because it is part of your de declaration that they haven't had, had been fed, fed this. Uh, which brings us to the declaration part. So this is where you sign and date the declaration to make it a legal document. Um, so you can see in there it's got um, that you haven't fed restricted animal materials to your goats. Um, you need to sign this and date it to make it a valid NBD. Um, if it's not signed and dated, it's not complete because it doesn't mean that anything um, if it's not signed and dated. So that's an important tip for that one. And then the second part of the LPA NBD or Part B is your livestock carriers details. Um, so this is important in determining and, and verifying and demonstrating you're meeting your fit to load requirements that you've actually recorded your transporter details and the movement records as well. So important to have them fill it out before they leave, or if you know the details, um, fill it out and have them sign it as well um, to fulfill that full, full requirement around Part B. So um, don't let them leave without filling it out and making sure that you've got a copy of that NVD um, as well um, once, once the truck leaves with your goats. So that's NVDs and I'll talk quickly now around um, things that the paper NVD that we see lots of problems with in terms of um, errors and issues. So if we can't read it, um, obviously no one's going to be able to read it so we don't know what's what's being declared. So make sure the handwriting is as neat as possible and that you can actually read it. Answer all the questions but don't answer them twice. So don't tick both yes and no for a question because that we, doesn't answer anything. Uh, we need to make sure we're signing them. Um, you need to make sure they're using the right NVD for your pick. So make sure it's got your pick um, printed on it. Uh, don't use white out as well. If you've made an error, um, you can cross it out and initial it or use a new form. Um, it's, a, it's a trick with the eNVD. You can actually go back and edit some of it before you submit it. So it, you don't have that error initialing issue. Um, and make sure you don't photocopy or use like a, an old version of them because they do change from time to time. And if you're using multiple or you're sending multiple consignments, make sure that you're using a new NVD for each consignment as well. Uh, so that's invalid NVD examples. Um, and, and something that helps, as I mentioned, with, with preventing errors and speeding up the process is the ENVD system. So E just stands for electronic, uh, which means you complete them digitally. So there's a, a website that we have that's connected to your LPA account where you can create the, the electronic version answer the questions online, um, and that's available then in the in the system for the person receiving it. Uh, there's also a mobile app that we've developed and it works offline and it syncs to the website as well. So you can you can work online and offline on the on the mobile app if you don't have connectivity. Um, it reduces time. So if you do need to complete an animal health declaration, you can actually do that at the same time as the NVD without answering the same questions over and over again. Um, you can still print them off. So if you still need to print off a copy, um, you can log into EMVD or, or, or create it digitally and then print it off um, if you need to. Uh, it's all stored in one place. So, you know, you're going to be ready for an LPA audit if you need it. That's all there for you. Um, if someone's sending you an EMVD, you can actually access it through the system as well as something you've received. So it's a two-way communication portal. Um, and you, you can share it through emails, you can share it through um, a number of different means as well. So it's definitely um, a tool there to use. It is free to use as well. Um, you don't have to buy books if you don't want to. You can actually log on to EMVD and create them for free um, if that's what you like. But we have just run a lot of webinars and done a lot of updates to our EMVD system. So if you're interested, um, we can send or well, there'll be lots of resources available on that um, online as well. So rounding out uh, around the LPA requirements, especially in the animal welfare space. So there is another section of the LPA standards that talks around animal welfare requirements. So this was added back in 2017 into LPA. Um, there's three requirements that you need to meet or be able to demonstrate um, as part of your accreditation. So one is to have a copy of the animal welfare standards and guidelines for goats. Again, it's free, it's online. And you can print it off, you can just save it in your browser, you can save it on your computer if you like. Um, the next thing would be reading them. Um, that can be a bit dry. So we created a lovely learning module um, that's available online for you to complete 
um, anytime you like uh, to, to run you through your responsibilities and those standards um, in an e-learning module. So that's the other requirement is the person responsible doing that training. And then the third one is if it's only relevant if you have staff that are helping you out and doing things that might require them to have knowledge of the welfare standards and guidelines. So just making sure you've trained your staff in those requirements as well. So that's the animal welfare requirements and we do audit against these. So do you have a copy of those? Have you done your training um, as part of your accreditation if you do get selected for audit? So. Uh, and I'll just talk you through now that just briefly around the NLIS requirements because it is a big component of um, traceability um, and important for all livestock producers. So NLIS combines three sort of pillars or requirements. So the first being identifying your goats. The second is identifying properties that might have livestock. And the third is recording those movements in the database. Um, and those three elements all work together to make that system happen which is basically how every traceability system works for any type of commodity. Uh, so we'll start off with identifying goats. So um, before goats leave a property, they need to be identified with an NLIS approved device. So that's one that's got an NLIS logo printed on it. Uh, if it's a harvested rangeland goat, that's a separate requirement, but we'll talk about that in another webinar um, on the 9th of April if you're interested. Um, but any managed goats need to be tagged and they need to have their tag um, remain with them for their lifetime to enable that lifetime traceability. For, for goats, there's um, two types of tags. One's a breeder tag and that gets applied to goats that are still in their property where they were born. And they can be in the year of colour um, on the screen there, um, depending on what year they were born. Um, in Western Australia, it's mandatory to do year of birth colour. Uh, everywhere else it's suggested, but um, that's an option for you. For post-breeder tags, they're the pink ones, and that means that the, the goat might have lost their tag or they weren't tagged in the first place, so they, they, they've lost traceability, but we still need to identify them. So they're the two types of requirements. Um, we do actually have ear tags available and also a leg band for goats at the moment as well. So there are a few options around for goats in terms of identification. Um, the other part around NLIS is doing your NLIS transfers. So that's recording the movements in the database. So um, the NLIS database is where we have all the picks, all of the tags, and where you record movements of tags between picks. So um, that one's a really important one. Um, and as a receiver of livestock, that's your legislative requirement to do that. If you're if you're moving um, goats onto your property, it's your responsibility to do that movement. So. Um, broadly speaking, it's two days of arrival. Sometimes it's called 48 hours. It depends on what state you're in. Um, but it's really important that if even if you've um, you know, asked an agent or you're relying on someone else to do that transfer for you, that you can go in and check and see that it's done um, to make sure you've met your requirements. So um, it's really important to have a have an account if you don't have one um, and, and have a play around. You can't break it, I promise. Um, but it is important to check to make sure you've met your requirements and that traceability through the supply chain is um, going to be upheld. If you do need some more information around anything LPA, anything audits, anything NLIS or EID or tags, we have lots of information on our website. Um, as I said, we've got lots of webinars going on at the moment as well if you want to dive into specific topics. Um, but we have, they're all our websites, um, how you log into the LPA database and the NLIS database as well. You can call us, you can email us, um, or you can yeah, uh, contact us on social media if you really like. Uh, but that's me for the moment. Um, and Dan, I, I guess over to you to see if there's any questions that we need to be answering. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. And especially for assisting with our understanding of traceability when dispatching or receiving animals, and that's including NLIS, LPA, and NVDs. So just wanted to thank all of our presenters for tonight's presentations. It's been very informative, and I'm sure that everyone attending um, online got a lot out of the presentations. So I just wanted to, uh, before we jump into the q and I just wanted to bring everyone's attention to the MLA Goats Hub. So this is a one-stop shop for goat producers with a suite of resources for um, anyone looking at going into goats or any goat producers that are really interested in um, finding out some more information about their enterprise and what you can do on your own farm to help improve your goat production. Another thing as well, a um, bit of a subtle plug, I'll also really like to promote um, the Goats on the Move quarterly newsletter. So this newsletter is a fantastic resource and is also a one-stop shop for any information going on in the goat industry at the moment. And 
uh, as it says, it is quarterly, so you'll receive four of those a year, and it's free to subscribe. Now, we'll jump right into the Q&A. So I might see what we have in the chat to start off with. So I think this one's going to be for Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, we have a question regarding NILS tag, so NLIS tag requirements for rangeland goats going to abattoirs. Will large-scale suppliers be exempt? So, um, like I said, I don't want to shoot the messenger too much, but there's a there's going to be an approval process for producers who who are true harvested rangeland goat producers, um, where they have to apply to um, be, be approved as a, a rangeland goat producer, and then that would allow them to move goats tag free um, through meeting certain conditions and and a certain NBD. So that one we can talk more about in our April webinar. Um, if you're interested, but effectively, yes, there's, there's a, a pathway for rangeland goat producers um, without tags, yes. Fantastic. Now, another question, this one could possibly be answered by either Baron or Petraea. Um, if I'm a new producer, who can I speak to in my state if I'm not sure or need help understanding the standards and guidelines for animal welfare, especially with goat transport? I can jump in on that one. Um, so definitely your um, Department of Agriculture in New South Wales, uh, we have local land services. Um, they are sort of the boots on the ground for our Department of Agriculture. Uh, they're a wealth of knowledge. Um, but uh, yes, using your Department of Agriculture in your state is probably the best place to start. Um, um, there are probably other goat associations that I'm not aware of, but Baron probably is. I would also say for New South Wales goat producers, definitely sign up to the Browsers Bulletin, um, which is produced by um, Carly Greentree. It's a great I think it's monthly newsletter that covers all sorts of different goat topics and that are relevant, not just fit to load and transport and they are available all the historical ones are available online so you can easily search them and find if you've like stuff on your own recalculate all that sort of stuff she's done a lot of newsletters which are really helpful fantastic thanks for your recommendations baron um and yeah that also brings us into a nice uh nice little segue where we've got also a range of different resources that you can access for free um and you can also order uh, as baron said the Australian Industry Welfare Standards and Guidelines for Goats from Animal Health Australia. And you can also order resources from MLA as well. So just jumping a bit further into um, the q and I think this one's for Elizabeth. So if I'm the responsible person, uh, do I need to complete the LPA module for animal welfare once, or is there a refresher that I'll have to do? Um, if you do it once, that's, that's um, that's great. And then um, accreditation at the moment, you renew it. So it's good to refresh if you feel like you need it. Um, there's no mandatory requirement to go in and refresh it once you've done it um, at the moment. So just once is enough at the moment. Yep. Fantastic. Thanks, Elizabeth. Now, another one for, I reckon it'll be um, Baron and Petraea. Um once I've loaded the goats onto the truck, who is legally responsible for them? Is that the transporter or am I still responsible for them? I can jump in on that one. That is the transporter is responsible once they're off your property, once they're on that truck. Um, but yes, you're responsible for everything leading up to the point they get up onto that truck. And then once yeah, they get to their destination, they're consigned to somebody, so either to an abattoir or an agent, and they become the next person responsible in that marketing chain. The thing is, if we ever get a report at the destination of there being an issue with the animals in question, we look at each stage. So we talk to the abattoir, see how they arrived at the lairy, look at their footage, talk to the transporter, about their journey, what happened on their journey, and talk to you as the producer in how you assess them. Did that were they fit to load? Did they load up quite well? Anything to try and work out where there's been an issue in that whole journey from the farm to the final destination. Great. Thanks, Patreon Baron. Now question oops, sorry, continue. I was going to say if you are 
ever have any concerns about your transporters or anything like that. There are, they do ha have had a lot of information mounted to them as well. A lot of them will have the fit to load guide in the glove box of their vehicle. Um, and they get monitored and educated through their own um, associations as well. And can I also add something? Um, just because the transporter is responsible once the animal's on the truck, if the transporter says to you at the point of loading, I don't think that animal is suitable to be loaded, then you need to listen to them because you could get them in trouble. And uh, just because you think it's okay doesn't mean it will be okay. Those guys are the experts in that field. They know how far they're traveling. They know how many stops they're making. And if they don't think it's gonna make the journey, you need to listen to them. Very sage advice, Petraea. Now, an additional question for, for Petraea and, and potentially Baron. And we've talked quite a bit about um, standards and guidelines and legislation and whereabouts could someone go to go and see, um, go and find that legislation? And if they're having trouble understanding, who can they speak to? All the legislation is available online. Uh, good old Google will get you to most places. Um, certainly I've put the links in my presentation. I can see a lot of those links are up there on the screen at the moment as to where to find those things. Um, if you are um, struggling to understand it, um, really it is often very well distilled down into those glove box guides and into the, um, the fit to load guides. Um, that's, you know, if you follow what's in those, you're going to meet your requirements to a pretty high standard. Um, but yes, again, your State Department of Agriculture or a veterinarian potentially, um, maybe the best people to talk to for a bit more information. Perfect, thanks Petraea. Now a question for Elizabeth. Will all waybill books be converted to electronic devices or can paper books still be used going forward? Yeah, so uh, there are electronic versions of all the NVDs available now, but there's also the books. Um, and the books aren't going anywhere for the moment, so there's there's no removal of those. Um, and just to be clear, don't get confused between an electronic identification device, which is the tag that gets attached to your animals, versus the electronic NVD. Um, they're two separate things. Um, but yes, the, the paper books are still available, um, and they're available electronically if you also want to try that out as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now, if there aren't any further questions, we might wrap up the Q&A there. So just before we wrap it up, I wanted to firstly bring everyone's attention to the survey link in the chat. So um, we'd really like you to, to fill out that survey, um, especially once the webinar is finished, um, to give us any feedback uh, and also um, provide, provide your feedback and, and any opinions on um, tonight's presentations. Um, I also wanted to bring your attention to an upcoming webinar on sheep and goat EID to be hosted by ISC and the Goat Industry Council of Australia, GAICA. This will be held on the 9th of April from 7.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So I wanted to take the opportunity to thank our speakers for this evening's webinar. We really do appreciate the time that it takes to put together these presentations and to take time out of your evenings to come and speak to us tonight. So, and we also hope that the information from this webinar has been useful and assisted um, everyone here with understanding a little bit more about um, fit to load in the goat industry. So once again, um, I'll plug the survey link in the chat. So that's um, down the bottom of your Zoom window. So if you wanna fill out the survey, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, and just to close it out, um, we'll be sending you a post-webinar email with links to various resources and a recording of tonight's session. We'll also be sending a link to the ISC and GAICA Sheep and Go EID webinar for anyone that's interested in attending. Now, if you have any questions regarding the webinar, please feel free to contact me. I'm available uh, at the email address that's on the screen currently. Um, but if you'd like any more information on anything goats, please head to the MLA website at MLA dot com dot au forward slash goats hyphen hub. Thank you everyone and have an excellent evening.